Boston Wellness Department. He's been a post-secondary coach and has been recognized as the ACAC Coach of the Year four different times. And in addition to winning uh, the national award twice with PCAA, Ron's coached a team Alberta programs in the past, and uh, and now he's currently involved coaching club volleyball. Uh, now that uh, his um, uh, kids are uh, moving up into the age group, so thank you, Ron, and. Yeah. Uh, I uh, appreciate you coming down to do a couple of presentations this week. Thank you. I'm just looking at my watch, my Garmin watch that shows my heart rate, and it's racing in the 100 zone, so that's an indication that I'm a little nervous. I'm rusty at this. I'm no longer uh, an instructor. I moved into an admin position, so I haven't been in front of the classroom for the last couple of years, but uh, I did spend a lot of years in front of a classroom teaching in the phys ed, kinesiology area, and... Uh, my background, I graduated from U of A and I did, then I did my postgrad work at Victoria in coaching studies. So I would consider myself over the past 20 some years as really a, a professional coach when you think you were teaching in the area and uh, coaching in the area. Coached, I think, 12, 12 seasons in the men's program at GPRC and then I coached in the women's program for six seasons and then after that I sort of kind of got out because my kids were coming through this that age and moved into coaching age class and started with my daughter's group basically from grade 7 and now she's in grade 11 so I've taken this group through the 13, 14, 15, 16 and now we're into this uh, I'm coaching a U17 girls team. So I've kind of come uh, last year I told somebody I, I feel like I'm a recycled coach because I've, I've been sort of at sort of a pinnacle level, not pinnacle level, but I would say at a higher level, the post-secondary level. And now I'm well, all the way all the way back down to the 13 year olds. And so it's been, there's been some really cool experiences and neat things that have happened for me going through that. And I'd say has made me really what I think is an experienced coach, but we'll see. Some of the things I'm going to talk about today is I've kind of made this 10 ideas for running effective practices. It could be running an effective program. Um, <clears throat> and these are really my, these are my thoughts. And my thoughts have really been formed through the coaches I've worked with, the athletes I've worked with, uh, the, the education programs that I've been through. So, but these are my, these are my thoughts. And <laughs> when I say recycle, that means I'm, in some cases I would say old school, but have really had to learn to modify old school. I listened to a podcast uh, uh, a couple weeks ago, and it was by John Kessel. I don't know if you're, any of you are familiar with John Kessel. He's a big guy with uh, USA Volleyball. And he was talking about this idea of uh, using our sort of past knowledge. And he, and he referenced this idea of, I was a surgeon, and I used the techniques I used as a surgeon from two years ago with what I was doing right now, I would probably be sued for malpractice. And I thought, you know, that's a good point. He was trying to make this reference for coaching, and I thought, that's a good point for us as coaches. And I want you to think like that. Is I've, I've embraced that as a coach, is that I have to continually look for new things, new methods, realize that kids have changed, and the system has changed that they've come up through, and they have different expectations, and we have to learn to adapt to that. And I, trust me, the things that I used to do as a coach, I would be sued for malpractice at some point, I'm sure. And some of you have probably heard stories. I know there's stories that roam around the volleyball back rooms about Ron Thompson in the early days and stuff. And I go, I, I'm proud to say that I'm reformed. Sure. <laughs> but I was, I was nervous this morning when I was looking at the schedule and the session that's beside me is the psychology of a referee, and I thought, man, this is where I need to be, is in that <laughs> session. Anyways, I'm going to try to get into this and uh, kind of go uh, through some of the things that are, are things that drive me and, and drive how I run my practices, and you'll probably learn more about me as, you, as I go through this. So the first thing for me is uh, about practices is this idea of be present, and when... When I step in the gym, I become almost like a different person in my mind. I, I'm, I'm present. And when I say that, I always have looked at my role as really as about providing energy, passion, 
plus the organization that we provide. And I, I do provide, I would say, a fair bit of energy in my practices. To me, that's the commitment. And I, I think about this thing as I try to model behaviors that I want to see in my athletes. If I'm present, I'm assuming they're going to be present. And it seems to work for me, as I have a, I, I definitely am there when they practice. I, my joke to them is I never go away. And I'll tell you something, I want you to change something. I will never go away from that. Once I know you as an athlete, if it's something that you do with your hands in the position of passing, and I have one girl that's got this little funky move when she passes and it just drives me crazy that I, I joke with her, but she knows when I'm watching her, she knows that I know what's going on in that thing. And I never go away from that. I'll, I'll tell her that every time until I start to see the change. When I start to see the change, I'm definitely going to give her some positive feedback on that. When it starts to happen, I'm going to give her the thumbs up and she's going to feel relief and we're, we're moving on. But my thing is that I'm, I'm, I'm always there. And I try to, uh, you know, and I, it was really cool watching Jen in the gym this morning. I thought she did a lot of the things that I'm going to talk about today, which was perfect. The way she moved around the court, the way she provided feedback, is that idea of having a presence is you have to be there. And this, you know, circulate around, have presence. You know, you, we see it in the educational program with coaches about, we talk about where you should locate yourself to give feedback so that you can see the rest of your, your crew or your team. You're not just losing track of people. You have a good presence where you know what's going on, what's, what's happening behind you. It's like you have those eyes in the back of your head, but you have a good presence in you. And you move around. And I, I move around in lots and I, my presence is they hear me, whether it's positive, corrective, instructional feedback, as I provide a lot. And as we progress through the season, I will get less and less of that feedback part. But where we're at, and I'll talk about this a little bit later in my afternoon session about the season planning is, is my role in the practice. But where we're at right now, we, we've started with our 17s. Yes, we did some tryouts in December and we kind of got things rolling. We've had a couple of practices, but I didn't really consider them real practices. It was me just kind of feeling out where we're at. What do we need to do? Are we going to fix that little thing on your arm? Like, where are we at with things on this? What do we need to work at? Sort of those types of things. But in our last few practices, that's where I've really, now I know what I want to do. And we've kind of developed our season plan. And my presence now is specific to the feedback we want to provide. So. This point is, is no more coffee coach. <laughs> I don't know if you've ever heard this expression, but it used to bother me a lot when I would see the coach show up with practice of the Tim Hortons Cup and practice would start and the coaches, the coaching staff would stand on the sideline and you know drink their, co and they would talk to each other about things and sip their coffee and stuff while the athletes are warming up, going through their pepper and stuff. And I thought, you know, we'd spend sometimes, I'd see teams spend 15, 20, 25 minutes in that session and the coach is sipping on the coffee on the side. I said, man, we got to fix that. That's not the presence that I want to see. And it used to bother me because when I wasn't coaching and I would see our college coaches, I'd see them show up and do that. It drive me insane because I thought you just wasted 20 minutes of your time. And to me, that presence in the first 20 minutes of warm-up is sometimes the best, most valuable time to teach and communicate and build relationships with your athletes. You can slow it down, talk to them, and do that kind of thing. So, and that'll, that'll feed into some of the other things we talk about, about when we talk about volume and intensity. So that was my number one thing, is you, gotta be, you have to be present. And that takes a bit of a commitment when you get to practice. And sometimes that's hard. And you know, I know that's hard because it was easier for me when I was a full-time coach. Sure, that was my job. You know, I could show up and I'm ready to go. But nowadays, you know, I'm working like you guys. I might be working a full-time job. Well, I do have a full-time job. Not like a full-time job. It is a full-time job. <laughs> and then I got to hustle off to practice. And I got to drive across to get into a gym, you know, get things set up. And it's how do you get yourself planned? How do you get yourself organized? And when you step in the gym, how do you commit yourself to being present. So it's, it's a simple point that way. Okay, <clears throat> simple practice formula. You saw this a bit probably happen, but this is, uh, I'm going to say this is how I sort of organize. And when I'm going from busy place, like you, I, I will admit, 
I was a fantastic pla practice planner head when I was coaching college. I had everything, all those things written out, all that stuff. It's a struggle right now. But, uh, you know, the fact that I have 25, 30 years of r going through that stuff is I can get away with it. S new coaches, you, you need to s probably spend more time at that. But when you don't, you need to have a formula. How are you going to survive if you, haven't, if you don't have that ability to have it all completely organized? And I sort of have a simple formula that I follow. And I do that sort of, my practice starts with a bit of the warm-up. We do the ball control. I work on some of the movement patterns, so some of the things that Jen was working on there, the little blocking stuff, is we might throw some of those things in as our warm-ups of the swing block. I heard somebody asking about swing block, and it's something that we have just added in our 17 age right now, is trying to do a bit of swing block. I'm still evaluating it, whether or not we'll continue with it, but we do these kind of movement patterns in our warm-up phase, and to me, I'm present. That's a great teaching spot for me to go through those reps in a really no pressure situation to kind of work that stuff. So it's that the main part, and this you'd see this in your level one, level two stuff. And <laughs> it's funny, I was talking to Lee this morning and we were talking about the method one, method two, method three drills. Okay? That was that's come after me. My terms were acquisition, stabilization, integration. Keith, you probably remember this. When we did our level three, this was grilled to this. It came a lot from uh, uh, the Quebec influence, and those were the words that we used was acquisition. And that's typically our method one, you know, where we're really working on the skill execution, the, the real technical side of things. And then we get into sort of, I like to think is like transfer to the phases, a little bit more of the, the game training side of things, and that's where I think is you've, you've acquired the skill, and now you're really trying to stabilize it and use it in its, it, where, it, where's it, where does it fall in the game? And then we take it to the next level, and Jen was getting into this as sort of the integration, and that's a little bit more of the decision-making type drills that she was showing a couple of those in there. So whether you use the one, two, three, or you use this concept, it's the same. And it's basically how we progress through learning a lot of times is we need to develop a bit of the foundation of the skill and then we take the how does that skill get used. And that sort of drives my, my, main, my, my, my main part of my practice is that we will spend probably at this, and this will drive my season plan as well. So where we're at right now is we'll spend more time in our practices in this acquisition stage, stabilization, and less a little bit in the integration. You heard Jen refer to that. Just in when she was talking about some of that decision-making stuff is we're not there yet. We haven't got to that point. And as a coach, sometimes you have to make a decision is that I'm, I'm not ready to go into the decision-making phase because I get into the decision-making phase, they forget of anything about the execution of things. So we have to figure out how we balance that. And we'll, I'll talk about that in my session this afternoon about how do, we, how do we manage that as we go through a season plan. But that's simply my simple formula. When I, we finish our game play, we do a minor cool down, and we do a wrap up, and then my practice is done. So it's a simple formula that helps me sort of when I'm busy and rolling through things that way. Practice planning principles, I always go back to this. And Jim asked me to maybe touch on this, is make sure that when we plan our practices that we use some sort of organizational technique this way and so typically when I design a drill I always head into that drill and how many of you are school teachers here you got a lot of you and this the, you drive this or you run this all the time right is when you have a lesson plan you create an objective what are we working on so Jen is working on you know maybe it's the the blocking mechanics of uh, she was working on the hand position there in the early drills I kind of peeked in and saw some stuff there so that becomes the objective that she wants to have in the drill. I, I design the drill, I put it on my organizational map here of how I'm going to run things. And then I list what are the key points that. And Jen, you could tell when she's coaching, she has two, three, maybe four key points that she's going to teach. But the key thing for us is that once we've designed it, once we start interacting with them, those key points always teach back to the objective. It's simple, right? It's really simple. But it's often really hard to be perfect at in your practice. Because we see a lot more sometimes than we maybe should. We see a lot more. 
and we say a lot more to the athlete than we probably should at times. We don't keep it a little bit focused, and that's what the key points need to drive to you. And I would say to you at the end, and Keith and I were talking about this the other day, is that at the end of the session, is the athlete should be able to repeat back to you what are the key points that we were doing. And I saw Jen ask some questions to her athletes, and you can tell that she's worked with those kids because they, they're, they're smart. They're on top of what, what are the key points that we want. And I, that was really good when I saw just a quick little reference to that. So, I mean, it's a, it's, it's a simple thing, but I go, I've evaluated a lot of coaches over the years, and it's not that simple. <laughs> it's not that simple to implement. It seems like it is, but sometimes we don't necessarily see all the things in practice. And I think as we get more experience with stuff, we start to see things happening more in front of us, then it gets a little bit easier. And that just comes, I think, with experience. So that's really a simple formula that I would say we follow. Don't let a drill become an activity. <laughs> As I've evaluated coaches over the years, we, we get good at whether it's we use, and I'm not suggesting you don't do this, is you see a good drill that somebody's using. I don't know if you saw me in the corner there. Dr Jen was running a little drill at the end, and I was talking with Lee, and Lee stopped talking to me, and I had my camera out, and I was just videoing it because I was going, I like this. This is good. Right? And, there's some, and I, I'm a believer in take things from other people. You see a good drill or you, something like that is write it down. It's funny. I have a little book there. I, now the phone's here. I have this book and I wrote a little light bulb. It's, it's goofy, but it's, I have a light bulb on the picture. It's my ideas book. And I pack these things around with me. But now that I have a phone, I have a section of my phone. And somebody was laughing at me last night. You, you were laughing at me like last night because I, I told them I was watching the match last night at U of A and I'm sitting at the end and I'm making notes of the things that I'm seeing and all this stuff. Because I'm, when I watch volleyball, I watch from a real, like, a student perspective. Because I'm coach and I'm interested in teaching. So I'm, I'm making these notes and stuff. And so I'm, I video things. But my point is, you got to be present and you got to know where you fit into that. It's, it's a great drill. Jen makes it a great drill because she has a presence in it. And she's teaching her points in the drill. So many times we see great drills that just become activities you know and the coach is cheering the the good result that happens and we focus on the result rather than on the process of things happening okay so my thing is don't don't let it this is the idea of when we talk, hear people talk about deliberate or meaningful practice is I think when I have a presence in my practice that keeps my athletes engaged in what we're doing and that focuses on this deliberate and meaningful practice. You know, that there's stuff that we've, that's been going around for years about this 10,000 hours of practice. It's, people debate it all the time now whether it's it. Whatever, I go, there's some value to it. But it's not just practice, it has to be meaningful or deliberate practice is what they refer to. And that just makes sense to me, whether it's 10,000, 15, I don't know. But if the more meaningful practice that I get in my practices, the better we're gonna be, okay? Um, and that's that point about they, they know what they're working on at the end of it. And sometimes you can take time to ask them that. Sometimes you'll just know that they've got it figured out that way. Hey, I, I can talk forever, but if you have any questions, <laughs> um, don't, don't be afraid to ask. If you want clarification on something, just if you have something to add on something. I know there's some people that are mentors of mine in here that if they have pieces they want to add, don't be afraid to throw some out. Like these are some of my, and they might be crazy ideas because I've lived in Grand Prairie. Sometimes we get lost in our own <laughs> space up there. <laughs> so, uh, so uh, yeah. Yeah. Right. Right. Um, success criteria. I think you have to be wise in using this. And, and early on is my success criteria often at this part of the season is, is quality. You know, sometimes that's enough for me is quality. I'm going to give a lot of feedback. But as we progress is we can put in success criteria. And you, you heard Jen refer to it. And it was good. Again, I just catch that right away. She said, we're looking for about 70% in this. And she's going, so she's doing this blocking drill. If they're not getting 7 out of 10 
balls that are going back to their side, does she want to move on? Probably not. Right? So she has an idea in her mind that it's, it's not just an activity, is we're looking to get something out of it. And so she's got an idea in her mind that's going to be 70% uh, success. And, you know, I mean, you don't, you're rough and you're approximate ideas, but you're given this idea is that if we've got this, we're may, ready to move on. The other thing is, if they can't get the 70%, you need to maybe reevaluate your drill because it's maybe not appropriate for the level that they're at. And she did another thing in there that was really good <laughs> that I saw her modify her drill to ensure that she was going to get the right thing happening to be able to evaluate the skill. You know, one time she was putting balls from the other side and she had a passer putting the ball in. And then she went to a little bit more of an advanced phase of the drill that where there was some decision making. And so she went to the other side and she said, I'm going to toss balls in on this because there's going to be a little bit more going on. And she wanted to ensure that the drill doesn't break down because the person passing the ball can't put the ball where she wants it to happen. Okay? So that's the part about using your success criteria. You have to have some idea of what you want to achieve and what kind of level they want. And make sure you design your, you know, like I can pick up a lot of good drills and, you know, maybe I go to the university level and I, I watch this great drill happening and I go, oh, I'm going to do that with my U14 girls and I go back and, oh, this isn't working out. Come on, you guys, you're just not paying attention. All these kind of things. Never blame your athletes, right? That's my motto. Never blame my athletes for, if my athletes don't perform it's me back at the drawing board trying to figure out, okay, how do we figure this out? How do I get that point across to them? So there's ways to look at that stuff and really evaluate that things. But use it. Use it. It's sometimes we, I, and I just skip over it sometimes because, you know, it's, it's a bit complicated, but I think it's simple in some ways too. Does that answer? Yeah, blah, blah, blah. blah. <laughs> See, I told you. Go for it. Okay, um, this is my fifth point. Is, uh, this is what drives me lately. Oh, and I would say it's for quite a few years it's driven me, but I sort of I've modified it as I go, is to think about it all the time, about how I, how I design my, my drills, my main part of my session. And as, um, I think about the phases or transitions of the game um, and train the skills and movement patterns that take place in these phases, okay? And so, if you look, in the old level one manual, we used to have this de description of a cycle of actions. Have you seen this before? This circle. You know, I used to teach the volleyball class at college, the introductory volleyball class. This was always a great question. And you know, you'd hope, can you fill this up? But look at the 1978 when this is, it's, and it, but the game hasn't changed. There's still, we still have the same, cycles and actions in the game that way but it to me is that how do we look at the game you know I look at the phases of defense to attack backcourt defensive player front court blocker what are the what are the things that they do in a game do they just you know do they just block no they there's there's another action that usually comes with that is right is they, they block and then they have to get off the net and they maybe they play defense they pass a free ball or something. So I try to, in my ways, I think about is not, and there's a session today that Pierre's doing. He's talking about sort of blocked and random practice. And uh, I used to teach motor learning class for about 10 years at, the, at GPRC. And there's a lot of stuff in the motor learning world about blocked, random, variable type practice. And it, it was one of the things for me where the light bulb came on and went, wow. That makes a lot of sense, and that makes sense about how do we help kids learn, not just perform. And learning means that it's a permanent change. So I look at the phases, and I try not to do a lot of blocked practices, bro blocked practice in my practices. But that doesn't that doesn't mean I don't have kids do a lot of volume of a, you know a block like Jen did. But I'll try to pair it with some sort of movement or some part of the game that's typically with it. So there's a little bit of a block and then I do something else. And the idea of this random practice side of things if in, the, in the science of it is that 
as I go through a block practice, if I just did blocked, right, it's like my mind just gets in this, eh, 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 and we just get into the, eh, 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 and it's, it's mechanical for us. But if I just did a block, and then I had to do one simple other thing, is it takes my mind in from that motor pattern into a different motor pattern that my body has to execute, and then I have to come back. And this pattern of going from one to the other of learning to recall motor programs is kind of the idea, simple concept of that. So I try to think of the phases of the game, if we can practice a bit of the phases of the game, that helps us with the ideas of uh, random practice and not so much blocked type practice. There is a place for some blocked practice. And the cool thing was is that I really experienced that when all of a sudden I'm going back to the 13 year old, okay, is they don't have that foundation. So we need to spend some time trying to get some of those motor patterns ingrained in them. And so we do a bit of block practice. But I'll tell you that my, the one principle that I really tried to follow, and I read it in a book once about random and block practices, once the athlete has a rough approximation of the skill, move on, right? It doesn't have to be absolutely perfect in a blocked, 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 blocked drill. So if we get there and it's not quite there, is let them move on. They'll figure it out. And when we do a lot of the random practice, they're still executing the skill. And you can still give them feedback about some of those changes. But that's, that's the part that sort of allowed me to sort of move on with things, is that they get a rough approximation on it and go. Because trust me, when we start throwing in swing blocking patterns, and some of the kids have never done this before, it's a challenge, right? So I have to go back. It's like these are girls that are 17. I really treat them right now, in, a, in some sense, on some of these skills is like they're a 13-year-old. We go back to a little bit more of the, the block type stuff, high volume, try to get it. But then as soon as we've got it, and the, the thing with the 17-year-old girl versus the 13-year-old, the rough approximation comes a little sooner. I can move on a little bit faster that way. But you'll, you have to be aware of that with what level you're coaching at. You'll spend a little bit more on some of those things that way. <coughs> so I just look at it at the different phases. That helps me sort of think. And over the Christmas holidays, we came down with our 17s and we played in the Pandas ran a tournament when they had their university tournament here. And we played in that. And that was an opportunity for me to evaluate some of the phases of the game that I thought we needed to really maybe work on as we progress through our season. So you have to do that in some form as you get some evaluation where you're at. What are the phases of the game? And I heard Jen talk about it <laughs> again, just in 20 minutes in there, she talked about where they are at and what is appropriate for their level of play. You know, the decision making that's appropriate. So in her, in her first month of her season plan, She's not doing a lot of decision making on blocking. She's got it pretty simple that way. And that's what she focuses on in maybe in her first third of her season that way. And she stays kind of in that. So they don't, they don't get too complex in that stuff, right? But it's a f they still work some of that stuff. This is what drives me. And I think about how can I make it real to the game. I think about how do I manage my volume and intensity in that. Um, how do I get the best transfer from the things that are happening in my practice to the ultimate thing of playing the game? Any questions on that? Simple? I think it's simple, but it's not always that simple. And it takes a bit of work to kind of get through that. But that's how I, uh, that's how I run things. And I use this still as I look through it once in a while. Oh, yes. You know, and the one is this service thing. And, uh, you know, how do you practice serving? Often we just practice serving. You know, we serve. We serve back and forth to each other at the end line. But what's the transition that goes with it? So I've, I've tried to create this little drill that we do now is we work in partners. You know, and uh, we'll have two balls. I'll serve a ball, and my partner will be at the net if it's Keith. After I serve, I come into my defensive position. Keith will toss one up and rip it at me, and I'll try to dig it up in the court. We quickly shag the balls, and he serves from the other side, and then I'll hit at him. So we just, I was just thinking, how do I make this better, you know, and keep them more engaged to, to do that? And i getting ready for this presentation a couple weeks ago, and I said, oh, yeah, defense. And I listened to a podcast again. 
and John Kessel was talking a little bit about because he's big in this motor learning stuff and he was talking about this how do we how do we make some more random kind of choices in that so think about the phases how can you make that and you know the the best thing that happens in this is guess what is your athletes become way more engaged and interested in practice when you keep them busier and I think if you can keep them out of a bit of the blocked pattern like that right if they've got to be thinking and being more engaged it's it's way better they don't they don't get they don't have that opportunity to sometimes get bored with things you know because I think the young kids can get bored really fast you know and my kids I you know I'm trying to do all these things and they still want to hey can we can we play oh yeah yeah well we'll, we'll we'll get there we'll do a version of play how's that oh, you know they, they want to play and so I'm, I constantly get those things, and that just reminds me as a coach, I go, okay, yeah, you know, they, that, that's what they want, is how do we get there and get it working to sort of everybody's happy in the practice side of that. So, so don't, there's lots of stuff in here about, um, this is the transfer of learning. We, I mentioned most of this, but it, this athletes need to train in ways to try to simulate some of the game, and that's why I think of the phases. I think of phases of the game. How are you going to use this? Where are you going to use this? What do we need to do? And we try to move on from that. Okay? Sorry, mm -hmm. Go back to that one. You said there's yeah. a limit non specific warm up drills. Yeah. This is my thing is uh, this was years ago. <laughs> it's not, it doesn't happen as much anymore. But when we'd come to volleyball practices, we would spend a lot of time doing running laps, you know, jogging around, and then we'd sit down in the middle of the court and we'd stretch. There was a lot of warm-up stuff uh, in my mind that was, it was based around the science at the time, right? But, and we would do a lot of movement activities or just things that were tag games. And stuff. I know those are good for kids, but what I think about is if I can limit that stuff and get into specific drills where they might be warming up, where they're touching a ball, doing those kinds of things, that's what I try to do. Yeah. Keith Hansen sitting around. You guys, do you guys know Keith Hansen? Wave your hand, Keith. Keith was at Red Deer College for a lot of years coaching their men's program. And get this. How many national championships in a row did you win? Eight. Eight times. Eight times I was on the losing end of all of those seasons. <laughs> <laughs> but Keith and I sort of grew up as coaches together and uh, we used to think, I know we would think like this because we'd talk about it afterwards and have, you know, a pop or something uh, to discuss like these things. Night. Like last night, yeah. But we'd think about how can I maximize the number of chances in practice, maximize the number of contacts because I'd be going, what's Hanson doing? You know, what's he doing down there? I just believed in the end he was just a way better recruiter than I was and I was a better coach but whatever. But that's what it comes down to is just trying to think about not getting away from, we used to see, it's not so much, and I see a lot of really great warm up activities happening with coaches all the time. And I don't have all the answers, I, I love watching other people's ideas on some of this stuff. I see a lot of really good things happening. I think if you can find things that are, simulate the phases of the game in the warm-up even is the movement patterns that they'll go through that's that's what I try to do in some of the the warm-up stuff like I, I very seldomly run run the kids uh, anymore that way as we get into balls right away and we work on you know simple contacts and then we add in some movement patterns and stuff like that always trying to do that always just trying to find ways to <coughs> manage that plus they don't like to run do they I don't my kids don't. My daughter doesn't. I know that. <laughs> mm. Hopefully that answers it. Um. <coughs> this is one that kind of just jumped out at me in the last few years. Is um, develop a clear vision of how you want to play and practice. What do you want your style of play to look like? Um, and You know, I'm a bit of a... I, I'm a really a bit of a nut on some of those kinds of things and I'll search things out, spend a lot of time <laughs> trying to figure some things out and uh, you know 
so how is the game meant to, to be played, it should say, is, um, and then really respect the game. Like, I, when I think about the phases of the game and how, how do we play the game? Like, you know, the idea of pass, set, hit, it should be. And when I play with coach, I struggle with this lots with the, the U13s and 14s because it's, it's, not, it's not always pass, set, hit. It was a lot of pass, pass, pass. And it would just drive me nuts. Nuts. It drives me nuts right now. And I tell the girls, I never want to see that happen in our practice. You know, I'm watching the university game last night, and I'm going, ugh, it's happening here. It's happening. They go pass, pass, pass. But it gets really crazy, right? Sometimes the, the speed of the ball moving around, it happens. But I just, I think, um, and I use that term as a respect for the game. The game, when it's played at its highest level, how do we see it played? And I want to try to get to that. And I really insist on this type of play. And I don't tell the kids that you can't do that. I says, we can do that. We just, we need to learn how to do that. How do we get there? And it's not perfect like I'm, you know, I want it to be, but I know right now what the style of play is, I think, for U17 girls now. I had an idea what it was for U16s and 15s. I knew what it is for college. That's what I want my team to play like. And I tell them, I think, if, if this is how we play, good things will happen for us. And I really use this to try to push away from the focus of the outcome of winning and losing or winning, you know, and I want to win. And I want to win and I want to push winning because I believe that if we play our style of play, is winning will happen for us. Not always, but it will happen for us. And that's really what we're striving. It's an indication that if we play to the top level of what U17s should play at, is we will have a chance to win. And all I ever ask my team is, let's, let's have a chance. If we have a chance, it might happen for us. You know, and we'll, we'll give it our best shot in that situation. So I really emphasize this. And, you know, when we were playing in provincials last year, when you get down into the crunch and you're in the final game and the pressure's on and you're just, what do you say in a timeout? I talk about, okay, how do we want to play? What do we got to do here, right? And you think about the pass, set, hit. We know we got to do this. How do we want to play? When things go bad for us and we start the bump, bump, bump sequence and we just get chaotic, okay, you know the timeout. How do we play? What are the things we practice? And I just try to remind ourselves about this style of play that we're trying to get to. And, you know, we all, in sports psych, we have an image. You know, we use imagery a lot. And I, I try to get them in this practice sessions is we think about this is our style. This is the image we want. If I'm in a heated situation, I try to bring them. I'm thinking in my mind, I'm bringing them back to this image about how we want to play. Not thinking about, I need you to go out and I need you to make this, you need to make this serve kind of thing. It's not, how do we, we know that, right? It's duh. It's like, you, let's just go, how do we play though? And we don't serve lollipops, right? How do we play? And that's the expectation. And I have to, sometimes, I live through the errors and failures with them on that kind of stuff. And this, this will be one of the things that comes up in, in, in the next slide, but we, we really try to allow them, don't be afraid to fail, because to me, a lot of the kids is the failure is not trying to move on to the way we want to play. You know, playing safe all the time is not the way we want to play. And the error you're making right now is you need to take some risk. If you don't take the risk, you're making an error right now because we need to move on from this stuff. And we need to find how do we get to our style that we play. And this what drives me as I read this a few years ago is sort of the high performance behaviors is within this style of play is there's focus there's effort and execution, and we, I just kind of drive those points home for me in practices and in game situations that way. And this is my point about being present in my practices is my intensity in practices is often no different than my intensity in game situations. I try not to be that different guy. Um, there's some different roles I think you play in some of that for sure, 
but my presence and intensity is always there in those situations. Right? <laughs> I know you're going to agree. So, um, simple thing is, um, another thing that I work on with the kids is about, this is the idea about taking responsibility, but that every, every, better every touch. Better every touch. And one year we actually wrote that on our, sleeves of our shirts was on the sleeve down there was the little mantra of make it better and um, <clears throat> whether I'm a passer whether I'm a setter whether I'm the hitter whatever space or role I come in in that phase is my job is to make it better you know and that's to me is it it focuses on this being a good teammate and the idea of selflessness and I constantly preach about uh, it, it's, it's a tough game, right? The first contact is tough. The second contact is tough. Uh, the third contact is tough. They're all important in their own way. Don't expect your teammate to be perfect. Expect that they're trying to make it better, and your job is to continue the pattern of just make it better. And we just, I just kind of work that little bit of a mantra, and I'm probably most people have something simple that they do that way, but that becomes a little bit of our philosophy as... Um, we don't blame the last person. It's a hard game that way. You know, because we'd see that sometimes. Is, and I have a daughter who's a setter. And so a lot of our conversations w will happen this way, right? Is that I'm just not getting the passing. You know, they're not passing, you know. And the problem is the passing. And I go, okay, how do we, how do you, how many coach your own kids? Amen. Coach your own kids. Whoa, nice work. <laughs> That's a challenge, eh? How do you be a coach? And me, for me, a father in the same day, <laughs> is, is how do we find that balance? But, you know, we have a lot of discussions about that, and I, it's, it's hard. How do we try to get that point across is like, listen, I could put you in that role, and you're going to be the one passing the ball, and they're going to be in that role trying to make it better. It's, it's one or the other. It happens. Your job, just make it better. Whatever you get, and then we just kind of work, work that through that way. Okay? This uh, train ugly concept, um, have you see, some of you have seen this, tr there's a website out there, it's called trainugly.com and the guy, jeez, uh, what's his name, I can't remember his name, anyway, Trevor Reagan. Trevor Reagan, yeah, exactly, and he's got some good stuff and uh, it might come up in uh, Pierre's session when they're talking about the random practice, block practice and stuff, it's really driven around this stuff, but I think it's, um, it goes back to a little bit of my, the part about how I plan the practices in the phases of the game, is you trying to get some of this random stuff going. But one of the points that comes up in there for me is this idea of trying new things and being okay with failure. And I capitalize it as learning how to be okay with failure. It's funny, that we, I, I heard some kids actually talking about this at a, at, after a college class and the college instructor was talking to them about it was okay to fail and they thought that was the funniest thing. They were mocking it and I was going, oh goodness. They sort of missed the point about, you know, learning how to take some risks and learning from the failure and, you know, it, it's going to happen but you got to try to look at the, the process of it and how do we get better from it. And I think it's hard for it's hard for us, uh, people learning skills, to go through that process. And I think that that's sometimes, for me, it was a good discussion to have the kids. Is I have some kids on my team that are they're afraid to fail. And what, what really worries me about that, it, when they're afraid to fail, is they're afraid to try. They're afraid to try the next thing. And the next thing, in my mind, it's the one point that's going to be the breakthrough for them to go to the next level. But they're afraid to go there. And why are they afraid, afraid to go there? And often with, I think, the 15, 16, 17, it's, a, it's that peer evaluation. It could be all sorts of things, right? But they, there's a lot of pressure and there's um, how they evaluate in each other, those kinds of things. So I think it's, it's a, not an easy concept. You know, I get it. But I think it takes a little bit more work and trying to discuss it and have that, you know, one-on-one -on -one discussion about stuff. And, but the challenge is, is you as a coach, 
how in your practices do you allow that to happen? You know, how do you allow that to happen? And we think about this concept of consequences versus punishment. You know, if I'm punishing kids in a drill because they're, well, you know, hopefully it's not because they're, well, it, it, they're not executing it, right? And so we throw in a punishment on that. Is what, how's that, how does that help a kid really move to the next level? I don't want to do that. And you know, I saw this with our high school team. And I, no, I shouldn't say that. I saw this with a team. <laughs> <laughs> well, I heard this discussion all the time was they would keep stats. They would keep stats of how many serves they would miss in a game. And then they would have to run that number of sueys at practice on Monday. And I thought, gee whiz, like I know the last thing in my daughter's mind when she's going back to serve, the first thing in her mind when she's going back to serve is, is it about where should I serve the ball? Who's the weak passer? What's coming on? No, she's going back there to serve and she's thinking about the punishment that's going to happen at practice if I miss this serve. And I just went, my God, this, this is not what we should have happening. Four minutes. I got two left. Okay. So, <laughs> um, I think this is an important point. You got to figure out how to let them fail and learn how to manage. I'm not saying this idea of consequences is if you put the consequences of the drill up front is we're going to play one on one and the loser's going to maybe it's take down the net, you know, things like that. But maybe. We need some fitness in our practice too, girls. And fitness is good for us. We, I try to convince them that sometimes it's not just punishment. We need some fitness in class, right? Or fitness in practice. So we put those in as consequences and we know those kinds of things. I'm not punishing you, but hey, let's play with some competitive. Let's, you know, we can understand it in a different way. So I'd say this is some good information that way. Push volume and intensity levels to as high as you can manage. Um, that's my little mantra. And this is definitely not the easiest thing for beginning coaches to do, is we see long lines in practices. You need to think about how you can maximize the volume in your practices. And uh, how do you do that? There's lots of tricks in that and there's lots of ways to get, but you know, you got to get rid of the long lines. If a kid is spending more than 10 seconds not touching a ball, I think you, you've got to change the drill. You've got to find a way. And often in my practices now, and sometimes you don't get this luxury, but if I get a gym, I try to get a place where I can have two courts going. So for the first phases of my main part of my practice is we can run a lot more volume and phases of the game happening on two courts versus one court. But sometimes you only got one court. So now how do you figure that out? You know, and that's, to me, it's, a, it's my presence and my energy in practice is we've got to move faster, faster, faster. And I use a term like, it's on the edge of chaos, girls, is we're going to push the limits of chaos here to find that balance in there. But we do that. And that's uh, my story was earlier I said about Keith and I. We, I know we were thinking about how do we get more volume, how do we get the right intensity in practice. And there's ways to, to manipulate. We'll talk a little bit about that. Hey, but 10 was... Uh, I know I've, 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 for a lot of the things that come across is really in my kids is intense, practice focused, always engaged, always in my face, that kind of stuff. But I go, really, I think we try to have fun as well in those moments. And I think it's a balance of trying to, how do we get those high performance behaviors of focus, effort, execution mixed in with having a minute of a laugh between us on something and then turn the switch back to focus, you know, effort, execution. And that's about being, having fun with your players, interacting, those types of things. I think that's, that's a skill. Not everybody has it, and a lot of us need to work at it as we go through. But I think it's, how do I be demanding and how do I still have fun, right? I mean, trust that they want to get better. That's the thing, is you just, you, we just don't know always how to, do that with each one of them but that's that's important to me too and uh, am I perfect at this nope but I work at this every day is trying to make sure that there's fun and I you know like I have a girl that played volleyball for me at GPRC for I don't know three years 
Uh, she actually went and played in Mount Royal one year. She's come back, she's helping me coach, and he sh I heard her say to her mom, who I work with in my office, is, and Ron has really changed on some things. And this is one that I've really tried to change at, is trying to be, have a little bit more fun on stuff, because you realize that in the end, that's what it's about, so. Any last questions? Oh, okay, two or three, awesome. <laughs> you can have two or three questions, she said, if you like. <laughs> Um, you know, um, there's a couple things out there. Oh, th she's asking about sites where you might go for gym or drills. <laughs> um, I, I can surf around YouTube and find lots of cool ideas on volleyball drills. What's the uh, group that uh, coaching? Art of Coaching. If you go to the Art of Coaching, I, I know they have a subscription, but sometimes you can find some of their stuff on YouTube free. Elevate yourself? Yeah. Yeah. There's lots of, you, you could probably search a lot of stuff on the internet and try to find some things. And the video stuff is kind of good. There's some good stuff in there. But are you a teacher? No. Just, you know, I say is like, look at, evaluate those things too from, a, you know, some of these things is, are, are the principles being adhered to in the drills and stuff so that, there's some great stuff in there, but there's some crazy stuff in there sometimes too. So, yeah. No. Yeah, I know. Right. Oh yes. Other things I'm thinking about. So it's like almost stressing your team to listen to the how awesome you're running a practice. <laughs> no. Well, it's not always awesome. <laughs> trust me. And this is my motto. I'm just trying to keep my kids off the base, right? So <laughs> that's my goal. And he, who is this awesome stuff, and it's like, oh man, like my poor team just sucks. Yeah. <laughs> they. Well, I know what you're saying because I feel like I'm in your seat a lot of times now because I I don't get time at work anymore. I know exactly. Trust me, yeah. I know. I know where you're at, and I know it's not easy. And I am the first to, I, I get angry when I hear about some high-level coaches criticizing the club and high school coaches not doing a good enough job developing players for me at the higher level because I go. It's not that easy when you don't have time. I know because I used to sit. We, we think volleyball 24-7. I'd watch video on everything, you know. It's different. It's, it's not easy. I, I know where you're coming from. And I uh, just say you pick up some ideas. I try to put this in like here's some simple. Because now I'm going back to really simple pieces for me. And how do I do that? And I used to plan every practice. But now I... But I'm lucky, you're right, I got all these years of, in my back pocket of things, so I know where you're coming from on this, so. Good luck with it. <laughs> <laughs> just have one more website, yeah, thank you, Rob. Thank you. Oh, hey, thank you. Oh, hey. Uh, another website is vcdm.org, so Volleyball Canada Development Model. Yeah, right, so yeah. Hmm? Volleyball, vcdm.org. Vcdm uh, uh, okay. uh, so Next time. <laughs> Perfect. Thank you. Hey, uh, I, I can, I'll make these slides. Yeah. If, if Ron, these are just my notes. Point. Yeah. Ron's going to give it to me. We'll make sure that you guys have all the presentations from the weekend. So uh, just keep that in mind. We'll make sure that we pass that on to you guys.